Here is where we gather in the presence of the sacred. Here is where we gather to experience the holy. Here is where, together, we face the unanswerable questions and acknowledge that not knowing is as sublime as it is frustrating. Here is where we unite in the midst of life and all the glories and suffering it can hold, knowing that both are ever present. Here is where we ask, think, risk, discuss, ponder and offer what might not be welcomed or even acceptable anywhere else. Here is where, if we allow it, we are deeply moved. Here is where we encounter each other in deep and powerful ways that surprise us, yet without which we would not survive. Here we gather to worship, to experience something happen, perhaps something different for each of us, according to our beliefs, something unnamed, uncategorized, and unusual, yet absolutely necessary. Here we are so gathered, our minds, our hearts, and our souls. And so our worship begins. These opening words by Patricia Sheldon welcome you all to our Sunday service. Welcome to those of you who have gathered in person at Essex Church, all who are joining us via Zoom from far and wide, and all of those who will be listening to this service via the podcast or our YouTube channel at a later date. We are all one community, however we join. For anyone who doesn't know me, my name is Liz Tuckwell, and along with Patricia Brewerton and other congregation members, we'll be leading today's service as Janine Powell is unfortunately unwell. This morning's service is on the theme of new beginnings. Janine chose this theme partly to it being still the start of the year, but also because there are new beginnings within the life of our church, with many new and old activities having been brought together to form a new program of events. Alongside Sunday worship, these events provide various ways to connect with ourselves, with each other, and with that which is most sacred to us. Beginnings, whether chosen or forced on us, wanted or unwanted, can bring a variety of thoughts and feelings with them. And the tools and attitudes which help us navigate these beginnings can be varied. So, in our congregational service today, we'll hear from Charlotte, John, and Patricia as they share their own reflections on this theme. But before we get into our hour of worship, let's take a moment to truly settle ourselves, to arrive fully here and prepare for this time together. Let's each take a conscious breath and another. With each exhalation, mentally and maybe physically, settling aside anything we've come inside carrying. We can always pick it up later if we wish. For now, let's bring our whole selves to the here and now as we prepare to worship together. As we do each week, let's light our chalice now, our symbol of our worldwide Unitarian and Unitarian Universalist community and faith. No, this one doesn't want to cooperate. Let's try the other one. Sorry? Not working. A moment to the rescue. Ah, it takes an expert. Okay. Thanks, Ramona, for that slight technical hitch. We call forth the light of our faith by igniting our chalice. This spark of new beginnings invites us into a sacred space to reflect where we have been and where we are going, even knowing that this particular flame will intentionally end, and with our ritual extinguishing, we fear not its end. For we know with brave hearts that from every ending of our lives, we are sent forth 
to make a new beginning. It's time to sing our first hymn, Here We Have Gathered, number 62 in your hymn books if you're here in the church. The words will also appear on your screens if you're at home. Please sit or stand as you're able for hymn 62. Let us turn inwards now in a time of prayer and reflection. For each of us, whom or what we pray to may be different, but we do so with loving intent and compassionate minds. As we think of the things shared or not shared in our joys and concerns, the things which bring lightness and joy and those things which bring sadness and turmoil, may we be held in the sanctity of wholeness. Spirit of life, God of all love, forever moving amongst us and within us, we call out your name. We seek to know grace so that we might honour our interconnectedness this morning with each other and those who have gone before us. When we witness suffering in ourselves and in the world around us, may we know compassion. When we are at loss for words, when we are unsure of the path ahead, may we be guided by this compassion to be witnesses still, to know and to feel the truth that this human family is broken and it is breaking with every life lost and with each time someone's dignity is denied. When we find ourselves exhausted and defeated and unsure of where to go, may we keep witnessing 
turning ever further toward your still, small voice. Let us here now take a few silent moments to send our loving thoughts and prayers to those people and places who need it most today. Spirit of life, remind us too that the experience of suffering does not close us off from the possibility of joy. May we know that our interconnectedness is a miracle and may it be a refuge for us, felt in the voice of a friend, in the touch of a loved one, in memories of days spent in good company. Let us take a moment to remember those times in our own lives and silently give thanks for them now. May we remain grateful for the goodness we've witnessed and enacted in the world. And may the warmth of our lives together hold us in love as we move into a future that is as uncertain as ever. Spirit of life and love, God of our hearts and of our understanding, we ask to know your presence, that it may remind us of what is sacred in each precious moment, even when in our brokenness. And may you teach us that sacred presence too, that we might know ourselves here and now, that we may be present for this one wild and precious life. May it be so. Amen. It's time to sing again. This time it's number 104 in your hymn books, Name Unnamed. This hymn speaks of some of the feelings and experience of change as we move towards starting something new. Again, the words will be on your screen too, and please feel free to stand or sit as you're able for hymn number 104.
As mentioned, being a congregational service means it's one of the ways we get to hear various takes on the theme. And John, Patrick and Charlotte have pleasingly done just that. We'll begin by listening to Charlotte sharing her reflection online. When I first came back to France, schools were closed because of COVID. So I couldn't find a job for six months. At the end of the summer, I applied in a specialist school in the town where my mom was living, but I really didn't want it. As an aside, one of the reasons I was glad to come back to France was that I had found teaching in London very challenging because of students' behavior. So I went through a phone interview with the specialist school and I had a face-to-face -face interview lined up. I really didn't want to do it, but I needed a job. At the same time, I was trying to call the public supply agency. When I finally got through, they had a job to offer me. Here is the kicker. It was part-time, half the number of hours, and in the high school where I had studied, now, my high school experience was bad. I struggled with major depression all three years. Most of my memories from that time were unpleasant. And for a couple of years after I graduated, I didn't want to drive past the building. So you can imagine how I was feeling knowing that I would go back. It turns out that I really enjoyed my time there not despite the challenges I was facing then, but because of them. COVID restrictions were still in full swing, so for most of the year, I only taught groups of 15 students. That made my transition back into teaching smooth. I had a mentor for the year, and she helped me gain the confidence in my skills I had lost during my last two years in London. I earned half a salary because of teaching part-time, but because of lockdown and curfew, it didn't matter that much anyway. Mostly because I was teaching part-time, it allowed me to spend as much time as I wanted with my mum, who was transferred to the hospital in the town where I was teaching. My going back to my high school gave me closure and allowed me to move forward. I had to go through teacher training again. And when I got my training placement, I moved to a town called Chartres. It's actually where I was born. And I currently live half a mile away from the hospital. This started a brand new life for me. I have a small flat just for me. I work in a variety of schools for since I moved to Chartres because of bureaucracy. I meet new people. Last summer, I decided to prepare a competitive exam to get a higher qualification. I teach four days a week and I go to uni every Wednesday. It turns out that the university where the course is taught is where I studied for my BA and the course director was one of my professors back then. Now, I have good memories of my time at uni. Not much of a party animal, but I loved the mental challenge of the courses. In any case, every Wednesday when I get to uni and when I walk the corridors, I can't help but smile at this turn of fate. There is a saying in French, la vie est un éternel recommencement. It means that life always starts back up. But for me, it's about doing some of the same things I've done before. Not that I'm stuck, but in a way that makes me feel like I've gone full circle and that it was always meant to be this way. Thank you, Charlotte. In some ways, echoing the themes of the reflection we just heard is this reading by Madison Taylor, who's going to be read by Juliet.
I was just thinking that we have a, an expression in English which is that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And that seems to fit Charlotte's story. This is called Completion by Madison Taylor. Just as new beginnings are important, so is honoring the experience of closure. Life is a collage of beginnings and endings that run together like still wet paint. Yet, before we can begin any new phase in life, we must sometimes first achieve closure. I'm sorry, I'm trying to read this with uh, reading glasses, which I'm not used to. All right, so uh, we must first achieve closure to the current stage we are in. That's because many of life's experiences call for closure. Often, we cannot see the significance of an event or importance of a lesson until we have reached closure. Or we may have completed a certain phase in life or path of learning and want to honor that ending. It is this sense of completion that frees us to open the door to new beginnings. Closure serves to tie up or sever loose ends quietens the mind, even when questions have been left unanswered, signifies the end of an experience and acknowledges that a change has taken place. The period of completion, or rather that of being just an act of finality, is also one of transition. When we seek closure, what we really want is an understanding of what has happened and an opportunity to derive what lessons we can from an experience. Without closure, there's no resolution and we are left to grieve, relive old memories and to point to, to the point of frustration or remain forever connected to people from our past. A sense of completion regarding a situation may also result when we accept that we have done our best and release the experience so that we can move forward. Closure can help us let go of feelings of anger or uncertainty regarding our past, even as we honor our experience, whether good or bad, as a necessary step on our life's path. Closure allows us to emotionally lay to rest issues and feelings that may be weighing down our spirit. When we create closure, we affirm that we have done what we needed. We are wiser because of the experience and are ready for whatever life wants to bring us next. We're moving into a time of meditation now where I'll invite you to contemplate on completion and beginnings in your own lives before we share a good few minutes of silence and stillness together. Our time of silence and stillness will be brought to an end by a chime from our bowl and followed by some reflective music. So I invite you now to get comfortable. Maybe putting down anything you don't need, feeling your feet on the floor, closing your eyes or softening your gaze. You may be aware of the sounds of people around you or noises from outside and you can just let those sounds drift away, allowing yourselves to enter more fully 
into that place of stillness and silence within. And in this time of stillness, you might like to consider times of completion, giving way to something new in your own lives. A new way of, of being, perhaps, or of living. Something practical or logistically new in your life, having been given room to be brought into being by something completing for you. Or feel free to meditate in your own way. Thank you.
And here's a reflection, sorry Gigi, and here's a reflection from John on new beginnings. Hello everybody. This uh, reflection is about the composition of my first ever poem. I, I don't usually make uh, uh, any New Year resolutions, but over the last few years since I retired, there's been in my mind a, a list of activities that I wanted to at least consider as, as some new beginnings. And most of these activities were creative, uh, as uh, I was very conscious that most of my life has been spent in analysing and solving problems in a, in a structured and systematic manner. This is a result of a scientific education and a lifetime of uh, working in healthcare, dealing with complex uh, issues in often in very sh short periods of time, 10 minute consultations as a GP. So over time I've learnt but often only after suffering some painful consequences about the importance of self-care. Maintaining my physical health through diet and exercise, trying to modify my overthinking with some meditation and challenging my self-centeredness with spiritual connection and service. But where was the creative activities? Where were they? Well, music was the first on the list, and alas, I do not play any musical instrument, but I do have a voice, and I have relearned how much I love singing with others. Benji's been great in that regard. I, I remembered enjoying singing in chapel as a boy at school, but thought it would be seriously uncool to tell anybody about that. So I was never in the choir. Painting has been a tricky road for me because of persistent self-criticism, I can't do this, and also difficulty because I'm colorblind. I cannot recall ever having any artistic encouragement at school or at home, but I have found a supportive teacher at a community art class who continues to encourage me to enjoy just trying out new techniques and different materials. So when I gradually realized that poetry had finally made it to the top of my list, I was once again aware of a mixture of fear, curiosity and confusion. How do I write my first poem? I had to learn poetry as a child, but I have no memory of ever composing a poem so, as usual, I avoided just sitting down with the pen and paper. I thought, let's do some research. That's a well-trodden avoidance technique of mine. A definition. A poem is an arrangement of words in a style more concentrated, imaginative, and powerful than that of ordinary speech or prose. Hmm, wow, I thought, oh, that's all right. So what form should this arrangement of words take? Well, some years ago, I bought a book of classic haiku poetry. I just liked the, the book. And until now, it has been quietly sitting, unread, on the bookshelf. Further research told me about the haiku's characteristics of a three-phrase format, a contemplative tone and an emphasis on imagery rather than explanation. It's also very short. So after some more time pondering about how feelings and thoughts become words and what are words, more avoidance, I had to sit down and take the creative leap. So, I'm going to read the poem I wrote, and before I do, I'll just share a brief reflection about it. In a small village churchyard in Sussex, my mother is buried. On her headstone is inscribed her name, Patience Humphreys, 
the dates of her birth and death, and just three words. So, here is my poem, and I'm going to read it twice. Lichen covered grave, inscription slowly fading. God is love remains. Lichen covered grave, inscription slowly fading. God is love remains. I agreed to write something for this service about beginnings, and then I panicked. When did I last begin anything? As I get older, there seem to be more endings than beginnings in my life. So many people I've known and loved, I just know more. But also, so many things I've enjoyed doing are now out of the question for me. I know I will not be able to walk around the Brittany coastal path again, carrying all that I need for the journey on my back. And when we first began that journey, I had never tried long distance walking before, so starting that was an adventure. And I will never crew a sailing boat again and hear David shout, ready about, lee ho, as I pull on the ropes to change the direction of the sail and make the boat turn around. These endings are like threads pulled from the fabric of my life. I stopped driving when we moved to Islington in 2015. It's unlikely I will ever move again into a new house in a new neighborhood. I'll never start a new job again, even a voluntary one if it involves a lot of standing or lifting. So no role in a food bank or charity shop. But beginnings are important, especially as one gets older. I can't replace those threads now missing from my life, but I do need to make its fabric strong again, and new beginnings are a way of doing that. Beginning something is a challenge and an opportunity to meet new people, maybe make new friends, and it is exciting. As I lay awake, wondering what I could say about beginnings, I remembered that coming to Essex Church was a beginning. I zoomed in late in 2020 when Sarah Tinker was leading the service. I knew no one. Sarah welcomed me, and we both thought we recognised each other, but have since realised that we'd never met before, and proof of this was my surprise that how tall she was when we finally met face to face. I didn't hang about for a chat after the service, but did keep coming back. And I'm now beginning to know members of the congregation. I was hesitant about becoming a trustee after an experience at another church where I'd been flattered to be asked to take a leading role without really knowing the problems the church had financially. No accounts had been drawn up for eight years, as there was no treasurer. The church was trying to run a commercial cafe, but had no idea how to do this and was rapidly losing money. I should have stepped down immediately as advised by friends and family, but pride or pure doggedness would not permit this. And needless to say, it did not go well. This taught me not to rush to begin something unless you know what it is you are beginning. It's okay if you're beginning to learn to paint or crochet, but if you're beginning something that means people will rely on you, whether it be a group, a class, or a church, you do need to think about it. Beginning is just that, the beginning. Day one might be very exciting, but what about all, the, all those other days that follow? So I thought long and hard before beginning to take responsibility at Essex Church. And so far, all is well. Another thought I had about beginning is again about ending. Everything we start, we will have to finish at some time. 
How are we going to do that? What do we want to leave behind? And now it's time for our last hymn, which is number 125 in your hymn books. One more step along the road I go. I love this hymn. My son had it at his wedding, a beginning, and a friend had it at her funeral, an ending. It's a lovely hymn, and words will be on the screen. You can stand or sit as you wish. Come to this week's announcements and that will then be followed by our closing words and some closing music. Thanks to Ramona for hosting. Thanks to Charlotte for welcoming online. Thank you Gigi for playing with us. We hope to see you again soon. Thanks again to Charlotte and Patricia and John for their contributions, reflections for this service and for those who read. Thanks to Juliet for making tea and coffee. She's already disappeared. Tea and coffee is served in the hall afterwards. And thanks to Marianne for greeting. If you're here in the church, do stay for a drink and a chat in the hall. And if you're online, then Charlotte will, will stay to chat if you have time. We've lots of activities going on during the week, and there's just a few to draw your attention to. Today, after the service, we were due to have our first in-person Sunday conversation. However, with Janine Unwell, this has been postponed, but will be starting up next month. Heart and Soul, our contemplative spiritual gathering, is a great way to get to know people more deeply. A reminder that our online Sunday Heart and Soul takes place twice a month now, but there's none, no Heart and Soul tonight. It will be next Sunday. The Friday Heart and Soul is still weekly, and on Friday the theme will be Changing Your Mind. Let Jane know if you want to sign up for Friday or for next Sunday. This Wednesday evening is an in-person Heart and Soul, gathering in the church at 7 o'clock. Next week's service, led by Jane, is titled Freedom, 
and that's followed by Margaret's Finding Your Voice singing workshop. Singing workshop. No singing ability required. Very enjoyable, come along, just have a good sing. With Jane's induction as our minister on the 27th of January, that's a Saturday and it's at three o'clock, there will be about 20 people online and 60 coming in person, so this will be quite a celebration. We're still looking for people to help out on the day, so if you can, please let Jane or Liz know that you're available to help. Looking further ahead, we're hosting Faith in Our Future, a full day of talks and workshops run by the Unitarians for Climate Justice. This is on Saturday the 3rd of February. You will need to book and tickets are available by Eventbrite. Details of all these activities and more are printed on the back of your order of service and also on, in our Friday email. Please do sign up for the mailing list if you haven't done already. The congregation very much has a life beyond Sunday mornings. We encourage you to keep in touch, look out for each other and do what you can to nurture supportive connections. This brings us to our closing words. As we look ahead to the coming week, may we, may we remember that changes abound around us, within us, between us, in our communities, our neighbourhoods and our beloved faith communities. Changes abound. May we each find the balance point we need as we move through our ever-changing world. The balance between the old and the new, between the known and the unknown. Between the familiar and the perhaps bold and risky possibilities that may be there waiting. So that we can bring the, those new possibilities to fruition for the betterment of ourselves and our world. So may it be. Amen.